um, free to do, you have free to roam. And then it's free. You didn't have all, you know, you just felt free. Right. And felt like you owned the land, you know, like the land was yours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, but when you came to, to Montgomery, Yes. It was a different story. Yeah, we had like, streaks, had streaks, and then you had, um, well, you know, I couldn't go in the back and run, and, you know, the, I missed the animals, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, it was entirely different, and I missed the big front yards and the big, it just it was so spacious, you right. know. Yeah. Just like, well, in other words, it was just like you had a ranch of your own. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you get in the city, it's a know, different story. It's a totally different story. Yeah. And you don't have that freedom to move, uh, and you don't have a lot of land. Right, right. right. Yeah. right. Uh -huh. Well, how oh, oh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. We didn't own the land. But see, as a kid, I did not know we did not own the land. Right, right. Uh -huh. So, were your were your folks sharecroppers? No, no way. My my parents would not refuse. It was my parents. Well, four about four of the people the farmers. They refused to uh, be sharecropper. Okay. So they was independent farmers. Okay. And the only thing my mother said is she she and uh, my father they got up early in the morning. They did it, uh, but they always had plenty of food. You know. Mm -hmm. What kind of what kind of farm, you know? What what kind of food did you farm? What kind of crops? Oh, everything! Everything we farmed, everything. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, cotton was the cash money. Mm -hmm. Cotton, and then my grandfather, my daddy QP, he had his own little syrup mill, and he made syrup, and they said he made the best syrup in Pine Level, mm -hmm. and then um, he would sell that syrup. Uh -huh. Well, would he sell it just to people in Pine Level? Just to people, anybody who wanted to buy it. Even uh -huh. white people bought it from him. Because uh -huh. what happened is, this is a long story, I ain't got time to get into that, but it was the old uh, uh, storehouse, it was the old um, grocery store, that it was an abandoned grocery store, just like uh -huh. you see in the West, uh -huh. that black people used to bring their little things, like their own little farmer's market, but we didn't want to know that. Oh, name. so everybody would come to that place. Yeah, uh-huh. No, whatever, whatever, you, whatever you have, whatever you have, uh -huh. you know, you didn't, you didn't have a price, but whatever, you know, whatever you have, pay whatever, pay whatever you have. It was, in the summer, it was peas, and you know, whatever you have, you know. Some of the white people didn't want, you know, want to share the peas, so they'll buy the peas from you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about, you didn't have no price, just whatever they give you, right. you know what I mean. So this was like a little farmer's market then, <laughs> where, you, where, you, where you would come. No, this was, it wasn't no, farm, it wasn't a farmer's market. Uh, no, it was just an abandoned, yeah, just the best the place. store that black people used to come and would bring that goods, goods there. to be sold. To be sold. Yes. And then we sometimes, um, they would even have changed. My mother used to sell eggs. The eggs, all the eggs, mm -hmm. that, you know, a surplus eggs. Right. She would sell them too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To black and white people. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what was it, uh, I mean, were there any racial problems in and Pine Level? The, well, let me tell you about Pine Level. That's the same place Rosa Parks stayed in Pine Level for a while, mm, you know, okay. in her younger years. Mm. But what I was trying to say is that Pine Level was a little town, small little country town, but in, I don't know, by other places, but there was no white and colored signs. Mm. Okay. But you knew your place. Mm. Okay. You knew you wasn't. You knew you wasn't supposed to talk back to a white man. Mm. Okay. You know. And then if you wanted to get your <laughs> fears no, you found some kind of sarcastic words or what did it say? Sad, sad mm -hmm. Something to say to get your meaning over. Right. So um, there was no. There was no signs. Only the only thing I remember as a child. I remember. Uh, that in the, the, one of the stores where you purchase your ticket um, and you can get your, the post office, the part of the store was where you purchase your ticket and when the post office was there, that's when, they, when the, uh, when the uh, postman couldn't do the drop in the rural area when the weather was too bad and the roads mm -hmm. were too bad, he, he yeah. leave the 
uh, the mayor at the post office there. Mm -hmm. But I recall on the right hand side was a bench, on the left hand side was a bench. And on the left hand side, sometimes that bench was to be empty. And my mother's friend would get a little, uh, at that time, you know, the, you don't know, but in my day it was Drake crates. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that's my day too. <laughs> <laughs> you got a drink crate and they would sit on the drink crate. And I was mm -hmm. wondering to myself, that's a whole bench over there. Why are they not sitting mm -hmm. on that bench? Right. But then, you know, that was for white only. Yeah, there were no signs, but it was custom, huh? Yeah. That, uh, yes. Yes. So you did not cross that line. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, were there ever any incidents where. No, I don't remember. The only incidents is the kids when they when okay, we call white people honest and dis. I always tell my mother that's dishonest white man. You know when they wouldn't pay you what they promised to pay you, so that they're gonna pay you. And I'm talking about in my day, right. they're gonna pay you, um, pay a black man a dollar to do the work. Mm -hmm. And then they come out and give you, uh, what do you call it? What do you call it when you give them vouchers? That's what they go to get food. Yeah, right. You don't vouchers. do you vouchers. Don't give you money. Don't give you money. Now, an honest white man will give you the money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. So there were honest white men, there were dishonest white men. Yes, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Well, when you moved in, well, what was your school like in Pine Level? Oh, it was a one teacher school. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the first school built by the, the as I learned from other uh, members in their communities, that was the first school. Built by the uh, federal government, mm -hmm. or the first black school, ele elementary school mm -hmm. in that. Oh, no, yeah, in that in that area, right? Because it was Spring Hill School, mm -hmm. uh, elementary school. Okay. And but that was uh, that was uh, the school was that was, they had the black people that had uh, built the school, but it was you know kind of crude. What you play? Cruelly, yeah, yeah. cruelly built. Right, right. But yeah. this is not the, up to standards. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when they couldn't do that, they they uh, had school in the church. The church, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. But um, this was the reason why I know I believe them because the bricks that were left over, we would uh, children when we would be playing, we used to take them and. Crack the hickory, hickory nuts. Right. So we used you to call them hickory nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I remember those days. Yeah. So was it a, um, a a number of grades in that school? Yeah, it went to one to six. Okay. And I and I, well anyway, I took advantage of it as a little kid. I didn't know I was taking advantage of it at that time. I was just doing it because of, well, the first grade and second grade. I memorized, I knew all the second grade, you know, at that time that you had to read the books and the arithmetic mm -hmm. and the little science, little science they ever had. I remember that first thing that teacher told me to do was to put some uh, peanuts in the water and put a top of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That was the science project. Yeah, experiment. Uh, her, uh, her experiment. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying, that was the second, that wasn't mine. That was, I wasn't doing that. The mm. third grade was doing that. Oh. So you had the advantage of observing. Everything so I, that, because all of the classes were in the same room. room. Right. Oh, okay. And then some of them uh, had the potato and watch how long it took the potato to sprout. Right. Yeah. You know. I remember those. You did the same thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I had observed all this. So when I, when I, uh, the, the the first teacher, by the way, the, my first teacher, she lived here in, in uh, Miss Lucy Davis. She lived here in Birmingham. So she was, she, after she found a school closer, mm -hmm. she left. And then another teacher taken over. Her name was uh, Miss Felder. Mm -hmm. And when she came, was, when she came to uh, Spring Hill, and she saw that I, I was so advanced, she put me. To, she promoted me to the third grade. Mm. So I didn't have to do the second grade. So you never did second grade. I never did yeah. second grade. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I did the first grade where you, you know, the second grade. And then I had learned the second grade. Even had learned the penmanship, you know, where you have, they, well, they don't teach penmanship now. Mm -hmm. You know, where you have to go up and do those loops and squares. Curves. Curves. So anyway, I did the penmanship little pad. 
Right. And right. uh huh. How was school different in Pine Level versus Montgomery when you got to Montgomery? Well, Montgomery we had classrooms. Mm. I remember when I was tested, and the teacher asked, and the principal said, "She's in the ninth grade. And she's not, not the ninth grade, fifth grade. And she's nine years old." She said, "Well, test her and see, and you know, see can she pass." So it wasn't like the Board of Education test. What it did was three teachers came in the room. And they asked me uh, how to spell this, and you know, how, you know, the spelling, right. uh, just like a spelling bee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then after the spelling bee, they asked me to read something. Then uh, after that, they asked me to uh, do the arithmetic. I even knew about fraction. Oh, sorry. Yes, because the teacher always say, <laughs> she taught the fraction, she always used the pie. And she always used to, I remember the third grade when they were start teaching the fraction, she always used the fraction. She always used a pie. Mm. So it was easy to remember. Oh, yeah. You right, know. Right. And so they asked me to do the long arithmetic, the long division. Okay. And the multiplication and subtraction, I passed it all. Mm -hmm. So they let me stay in the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. So you were you were ahead of your time then. Huh? No, no, I don't say that. It was just because I was in that. Yeah, yeah. You you had you had. I gained took advantage of. Yeah, uh -huh. take advantage of. And I might. And one reason too is because my other the only one friend, the one girl that was very close. And she was in the second grade. So mm -hmm. we was always competing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the second grade. What school did you attend in Montgomery? Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington. Yeah. And how was that an elementary? It was, it was an elementary t 1 through 12. 1 through 12. Uh -huh. okay. But um, when I arrived in Montgomery, there was on, there was a uh, school, uh, what do you call it? What did you call it? When you don't have enough. It was overcrowded. Mm -hmm. okay. So there was building another, there was building the high school. And well, I remember this. I, uh, we had split, split sessions. Right. Uh, one book, you know. Yep, I remember that. And um, I, I went, we went to evening session. Mm -hmm. My sister and I, so my mother had both of us, you know, from, from the same, living on King Hill, mm -hmm. you had the same. Uh, Se uh, session, right. but what happened is, um, as I look back, there was a school where high segregation is. There was a school only three blocks from my home, mm -hmm. but, but I could not. But that was school. quite elementary school. Mm -hmm. I stood right on the corner of Yancey uh, and Florida Street and watched these white children go to school, mm -hmm. while I had to take the bus. And go to go across town to a black school to mm -hmm. Booker T. Washington. So now Kings Hill was situated between these two white communities. So those children went to that school. Yes. And you had to be bused away. Yes. So I mean, what what was that like having, you know, your community being situated as it was? I mean, you had to pass through those communities coming and well, going. Well, I, I, maybe that's maybe they were setting the stage for me to rebel <laughs> because I had to deal with. See, or uh, I uh, living on King Hill. If you lived on King Hill, you had to deal with white people all the time, and your parents taught you to be on your best behavior. Don't hit them. But you know what I don't, my parents say, and, and you will find that in black women, and I think that's why black women do that. Say something to them to hurt them. Mm. Say a dirty word. Mm. So but I never. I, but Your mother I, taught you to do that. Are you just that was, No, she told me that I couldn't. I couldn't hit those white kids. I would be in trouble. The KK would come and pull us out and beat us and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Horror story. They tell you enough horror stories so you wouldn't dare. Scare you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You so you wouldn't, you know, they had to, you know, hit a white kid if they do and tell them run away from them, but you would never hit them. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, uh, so when it was a uh push and shoving thing on the bus, the bus driver threatened the black kid, I'm gonna put you off the bus. Mm -hmm. You know, tell the the black kids are gonna push you off the bus. So we didn't sometimes it's, the older kids were pushing, sure, push, do a push number when he stopped, you know, go like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. The push number, then, you know, when you know, you knew better. Mm 
not to touch a white kid. Yeah. So what happened is, um, how we did it, we would go to Capitol, uh, Old Park bus, the Capitol Heights, take Old Park bus to downtown Court Square, and then transfer to Capitol Heights. And, um, so these were public buses that you had We had to use not public buses. No, not school buses. Not school buses. It was until it was, they, they didn't get the special city bus to come to pick us up until three years, uh, until after this. Mm -hmm. They had to uh, petition the principal and the yeah. community. I all had to petition the, them to do that. So as elementary school children, you were taking public transportation to school? Yes, to go to Booker T. Washington. Mm. Um, and um, we were, uh, well, how we were doing, instead of going into the, the Atlanta Highway to Bradley Drive into a deeper white community, uh, what some of the kids would do, they would get off at uh, Capitol Parkway and walk across us. That's about, I don't know if you remember, but it's approximately four blocks across from Madison to Upper Wetonka Road. So if we get off at Capitol Parkway, we would be right in front of a long salmon shop. So we'd be home safe. Mm. <laughs> you know, long salmon shop was a well-known black-owned little salmon shop. You know, mm -hmm. but the best place you could go on King Hill to get a sandwich. Right. You know, you know, in those days, like a, a well, like a fish sandwich, bologna sandwich. Mm. You know, so that was a little sandwich shop there. All right. Uh, <laughs> all right. Excuse me. I always tell my students, turn uh -huh. those. <laughs> cell phones off and mine goes wrong. <laughs> um, what about high school? How was high school in Montgomery? And did you go, still go to Booker T for high school or had they built yeah, uh, school? They built a high school. Well, we did this um, from September to December. We did this um, split session from September to December. January, this, they uh, stopped. Mm hmm and we did, but we did this split session from September to December. Okay. And um, it was a high school, and um, so uh, what I was saying is that, um, at, but they still hadn't put a, a special bus on the line for the black kids. So what happened? The community in the back of me, like it was a affordable housing for whites. Mm. They call Holland Garden. Okay. Uh -huh. So then they put a bus on the bus line, extended service to that area. Because mm. my mother said, it's poor these white people are, and they they own maids. <laughs> That's what my mother would always mm. say. But they would, they would have a full time maid that was having just a, what yeah. they call it, a day. Right, domestic. Domestic for domestic. just a day lady. Yeah. Right. You know, you know. Right. Somebody come in to wash for uh -huh. them. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that's just like it was here. Uh huh. Right. So anyway, any, anyway, they put Harlem Garden. So that see Madison Avenue and Upper Wetonka run parallel. Mm -hmm. But after it passed King Hill, it take like a hairpin turn and go to Wetonka. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh huh. That same the Upper Wetonka Upper. Right. I live off of Upper Wetonka and Dixie Drive. Oh, okay. But then it take a hairpin turn and go mm -hmm. to uh. Uh, we Tonka. Right, right. So, so um, your high school days, what do you remember about your high school days? Oh, well, anyway, um, my, my high school days, uh, we, um, we had teachers, you know, who had went away to others uh, from here. Mm. Like my well, my favorite teacher. Now you want to go to eleventh grade? Or? Yeah, you were in Montgomery. Montgomery, right. and you're talking about the eleventh or uh, eleventh grade. Right. right. Before uh, before I def before you uh -huh, defiled the segregation law. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, my my the teacher she had gone to where well, New York mm -hmm. to Columbia University to get an MA a bachelor degree, mm -hmm. 
And I don't know where Ms. Joseph Lawrence, but she didn't get, uh, got her degree. But those two teachers, uh, I don't know what they was, they taught us about what to expect from social change. This was Ms. Josie Lawrence. And Geraldine Nesbitt. All teachers didn't do it, but I just happened to be in their class. Mm -hmm. and, and they taught you what? Uh, what? What to expect with the social change, because that was 1954 after Brown versus the Board of Education. Right. Right, they was teaching us what to expect mm -hmm. if social change come. Mm -hmm. And you know, they was, they taught, well, anyway, uh, we would have Negro History Month. Well, in the elementary school, we had it too, but it was just like one uh, one week. And then later, when I got to the 11th grade, uh, we did it more than one week because it took us that long to get the material together mm -hmm. because we couldn't, there was nothing in the library about black people. Right. So the teacher would bring you clippings from magazine, New, New York Times, and different articles. Mm -hmm. And then Ms. Um, Ms. Joseph, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Lawrence, she had us to subscribe, subscribe for the uh, current events. You know, it's a little paper, news, little book, news uh, paper right. for students. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember she was telling us about. My literary two teacher, oh yes, Mrs. Nesbitt, this is before Ebonics, she refused to teach uh, grammar. Mm -hmm. She taught literary two. Oh, okay. She taught literary two. And she refused to uh, teach grammar. So another teacher taught us grammar, taught me uh, the student grammar. And uh, what she did, she had us to write essays. And she talked about, uh, and you know, talked about our heroes and what and how how our life was here. Mm -hmm. And during uh, Negro History uh, Week, we would bring in different things about our heroes. What did they tell you to expect with the change that? Well, that's this. The change was well, well, there was. At that time, it was about Board of Education. It wasn't about bus desegregation. It was about school because the reason why they was talking about it, school is when uh, the principal, C.T. Smiley, would put, uh, ask for what you call desks mm -hmm. and even um, dishwasher sterilizing, uh, dishwasher mm -hmm. for the lunchroom. Right. And, uh, they, and they would they renege. And, uh, and uh, we had to go to uh, the student council, and the student council did rallies to even buy a dishwasher. Mm -hmm. You had to raise your own money. Yes. To, so the, the school board was not um, affording you the same things that, that they gave to, to the, the white, white students. Mm -hmm. And the chemistry lab, we didn't have a chemistry lab. They, the teacher, when they did an experiment, the teacher brought in the supplies. Mm -hmm. I raised money to the student, you know, from the student. Right. It wasn't it wasn't supplied by the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. So uh this is what we were expecting that uh and the curriculum, mm -hmm. you know, changing the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes the teacher was oh you will be you have books for math, but you wouldn't have that was general mathematics, but you on your card it was be algebra one, but you you only had general general math. General math. Mm -hmm. So that was that was the change in the school curriculum was going to be different. That we would have to study harder, right. and then you do, you know and everything. If school integration came, right. that we would have to study harder, and then the white teacher would you know probably would uh, favor the uh, the white student more. That was it, in teaching us all of this, and so anyway, by um, I remember before I defiled the segregation law, that that same month, right? 
We talked about Harriet Tubman's Sojourner True, Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Divorce, mm -hmm. and we talked about Booker T. Washington, and um, even Jackie Robinson breaking the baseball barrier, mm -hmm. you know, in sports. Mm -hmm. And because you know, black people, anytime there was a flat enough play, there was a the play baseball. Right. We was good at it, oh, yeah. <laughs> even just in the local cities, right? Mm -hmm. But it, um, anyway, we talked about there, and we talked about job discrimination. Yeah. Uh, like, you could not be working to five and ten as a sales lady, you could only sure. be a maid, you know. So we talked about the, all those, all of those things. So you think that was having an impact upon? Uh, by talking about the Black History subjects, you yes. think that would have an impact upon you as a student, and you'd actually take that outside of the classroom, then, yes, and into. Yes. Into life. But I had already told them after if I graduated from high school, I wasn't going to Alabama State. Mm. That I was going to go north like this next week to so I could study study how to free my people. Mm. Because I had read about uh Du Bois and Frederick Douglass that was north you know, come from the north. Right. So I figured that the northern people knew more about how to change these mm -hmm. laws, the discrimination laws, the Jim Crow laws. Right. So the day that you decided, how did that happen? Did you did, had you planned to do what you did on the <laughs> board? Just just sort of tell us what actually happened. No, it was impossible okay. because look, if you get the record and you see where I was sitting, I wasn't breaking the law. Those laws was allotted to black people. Those, I mean, say those seats was uh, allowed black people because I was sitting in the same seat mm -hmm. before, you know. If I was going to uh, do, uh, wanted to make trouble, plan it, the student now, we would have sitting up front so we could really give us some, tr you know, a hard time. Mm -hmm. But it just so happened that we used to browse around the tents. I could not tell you today why I didn't continue to walk down town to the 5 and 10 and just browse around. Mm -hmm. I could not tell you. But all I know is that I saw when I walked down the Capitol stairs, uh, steps and I came to uh, Bainbridge and Dexter. I, mean, I think that's Bainbridge and right. Dexter, right? I saw my classmates standing there and it was two more or three more with me. So when we boarded the bus, we set arms at each other. And I, you know, as far as we could go. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, there wasn't too many whites and there wasn't too many blacks at that time. And we secured those seats. Now we knew nobody else could sit ahead of us. Right. So, but as the bus... So this was the first seat for blacks. You seat from that back. Right. right. Uh -huh. And whites took the seat just ahead of that. Front, Front. yeah. Uh -huh. But on different bus lines where there was more uh, black passioners, they could sit further up front, mm -hmm. like South Jackson, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, in Washington Park, you could sit further up. Right. Yeah. But uh, anyway, if the bus began to get crowded, more passion avoided the bus. Mm -hmm. Then the, the bus motorman looked back through the rear, the rear mirror, uh, view mirror and asked for the seats. And the two, three ladies, three students, they got up. And they went to stand in the back. There were no seats to sit. There was no seats in the back, in the back. At that time, there was no other seats. And um, at the time, he asked for the seat. When we first got on there, when we first boarded the bus, that was seat, but we secured this, this line. Like we made that boundary line there. Right. Yeah. But as the bus proceeded down Dexter Avenue, both passion, both black and white, got on the bus. Mm -hmm. So the bus motor wanted those, in the order to secure that more um, seats, he needed the whole row, the mm -hmm. whole, you know. So did he look in the rearview mirror and ask you yeah, to get up? To get up. And they got up. Mm -hmm. 
Well, he, he looked and he shouted at us to get up. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get up. And because by that time, um, it was white people standing and black people standing. Mm -hmm. So this white, this I recall, it was this white, it wasn't an only white woman now. This was like a clothes store clerk or someone. Right. I don't know, you know, I don't know the identity of the person. All I know, she was white. Right. But she wasn't elderly. Right. Because if she'd have been an elderly white woman, the bus motor wouldn't have had to ask me to get up and give this lady a seat. Mm -hmm. I elderly black person. Right. But anyway, he, I swear to see, the three ladies got, three students, I mean, got up and, you know, stood up. And then he proceeded on down to he knew I wasn't breaking the law mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to a uh, court square. Right, right. right. But the why I could hear him, you know, I don't know what they were saying, <laughs> you know, mumbling uh, to him. I imagine they were saying to him, are you going to let her get away with that? You know what I mean? When I got to court square, mm -hmm. now, do you remember the seat was, mm -hmm. next to me was empty. So court right. square is where all the buses, uh, how would you say this? They connect and they... Right, that was sort of the... Um, how would you say, where they make their connections? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. I, I, I don't know the depot, word. Depot, depot. Uh, it wasn't a depot, it was yeah. like where you can make your connection. With other buses. Other buses, right. yeah. Okay, okay. So this pregnant lady, Mrs. Hamilton, Hamilton, she had gotten off the Maxfield bus, but mm. she didn't know the altercation was going on because we wasn't. So, so you knew her. I knew she was my neighbor. Oh, okay, okay. Um, she didn't know the altercation was going on, mm -hmm. so the, the bus now the bus is crowded now. So she had to come to the back door and board the bus because you remember when the white people are standing. In the, in, the, in the standing in the bus, right in the aisle, that's right. Black people couldn't put walk past in between them because they didn't want you to touch them. Exactly. exactly. So you had to go to the back door. Mm -hmm. So she come up the back and sat. She sat next to me. Mm -hmm. Now the whole seat was the other seat was empty mm -hmm. because the white lady refused to sit in it because I was sitting on the opposite side. Right, and no black person would sit. In that seat, either. Not uh, no, nobody, yeah. no one. After the, after he had asked the uh, the three ladies to get up, mm -hmm. they had heard him. The same people was on the bus, right? So the black right. they didn't, they were in there sitting in the seat, either, so it was it was left there. So he was waiting for me. I was the whole out. I, I was the one who, who was keeping it, <laughs> keeping her from getting the seat. Mm -hmm. So I was the one who was targeted. So anyway. As I got to Court Square, he held this uh, traffic patrolman, and the traffic patrolman come on the bus car and asked me why I was sitting there. Why I was I? Oh no! At first, he asked me, asked the men in the back, it was two men had was on the bus too. They were sanitation workers. Said, "Are uh, you men are not gentlemen enough to get up and give this lady a seat?" And the two men got up and got off the bus. They said they didn't want to be part of it. They, was, they didn't want to be part of it, so, mm -hmm. you know, and they got off the bus. So anyway, uh, the uh, traffic patrolman asked me why, you know, after she got up and, and went inside where the men sat, the pregnant lady, Mrs. Hamilton, mm -hmm. then they asked me why. I said, it's my constitutional right. I paid my fare. Um, you know, it's my constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. And he he yelled to the bus motorman, I don't have any jurisdiction here. And he got off. Now the people, the bystanders, they're at Coast Square, because that was bitches, you know, mm -hmm. you had the petition. You had a petition. Right. White on one side and black on the other. But there wasn't no sign saying that you knew. Right. You know, Again, where the black people supposed to sit and the white people supposed mm -hmm. to sit. Now, was this officer, was this a Montgomery police officer? Uh, traffic patrolman. Traffic you know, the patrolman. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. All right. So he was not a police, police officer. No. He's, yeah. He got on the bus. He was the first one okay. to ask me to get up beside the bus motorman. Right. And I refused. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got off. So I thought it had ended. So, and because uh, remember, around about maybe twenty more, twenty um, 
Vlad Bystan, would you say Bystan is a, a, a waiting to board other buses, mm -hmm. right? Right. But, and um, he pulled, I guess to, to stop from having a riot, he pulled the bus one block to build in commerce. And lo and behold, two traffic policemen come on the bus. Mm -hmm. They came on the bus, to, not traffic policemen, Called the men, regular policemen. Regular police officers, Montgomery police officers. Mon Mon Montgomery police officers. Come on the bus, and they, when they came on the bus, they asked, asked me, then they say, they said, Gal, why are you sitting there? I said, I repeat, I became more defiant. Mm. I said, it's my constitutional right. It's a constitutional right. They knocked my books out of my hand. They said I scratched them, but I didn't scratch. One to one, on, but you know, as teenagers, mm -hmm. that's one thing we did. We do <laughs> long fingernails. Right. So um, I don't know. They said I clawed him and I scratched him. Did you resist? Did you? Ah, uh, they said they said in the police report that I clawed and I kicked and I scratched and I did all that kick. Now, can you imagine in that day and time, mm -hmm. if I had kicked one of those police, I would have been bruised. Don't mm -hmm. you think they would have slapped me or punched me or something? I did not kick so those people. No, because I wasn't bruised or anything. Right. You know, and I was, well, what happened was after, um, they, I just, you know, did like what I saw black men do when they come and arrest them in our community. When they come and arrest them in our community, they, now this is for dishonest conduct. Really, I'm talking about this is a real case mm -hmm. of dishonest conduct or drunken <clears throat> or something right. like something or, what you call domestic violence? Or I see the black man, hmm. and there's some just go look, <laughs> and there's sometimes they ask, they ask, the police when they pick them up, they ask, boy, come over here and put him in the car. Hmm. You know what I mean? Right. So the right. other men will take him and put him. In. So that's what I did when they knocked my books out of my hand, and they, but they said I scratched them. I don't believe that. But anyway, my nails might have hit them when they <laughs> really knocked my books out of my hand, hmm. and then. This and, and grab one, grab one arm, and one grab the other. And I just went limp, and I refused to walk. Yeah. So they just had to carry a 110-pound lady right. <laughs> best student to the car. Mm -hmm. And when I got to the car, they had me to stick my hands out the window, and they handcuffed me mm -hmm. through the window. Through the window. Yeah. Then... Um, they took me to City Hall, just like an adult. I said, oh, now nah, I won't have to be, you know, what, you know, I have, I had heard about reformatory school. Right. right. So I said, oh, Lord, I'm going to be picking a lot of cotton now. But this is, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the discipline, that's how they discipline mm -hmm. the uh, reformatory school by making them work. Right. You know, different right. kinds of work, you mm -hmm. know, but, you know. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm going to the reformatory school. That's what was in the back of my head. They took me to City Hall. Mm, downtown. Yes, they took me to City Hall. And I had on a light blue sweater and a dark blue skirt. And they was talking about my bra size. And then they was intimidating me. And they said they were going to send them up to uh, uh, Admiral, the women's uh, prison. Mm -hmm. Now, I knew I wasn't going there mm -hmm. because that's a women's <coughs> prison. Yeah. But it was terrible, that's what it was saying. And it was, oh boy, it was terrible. Then they brought me back, and I didn't know what was going to happen. They uh, put me back in the car and took me to city jail. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, took me, and um, remember I was handcuffed, and I had to pass these white men. All white men, no, I didn't steal a black person. Not even a janitor or anyone. Mm -hmm. So they put me in the jail cell. And when, you know, the old days, that sound, the, the keys, they, not like today when you just remote and you just press and the door close. Mm -hmm. You know, they hear this, it's still, ooh, it's still in the back of my head now. Mm -hmm. I can still vividly, that Slam. sound, when they, the door, the mm -hmm. jail door slammed shut. What did that represent to you? The sound. Uh, what is what is? Um, the, what the sound was like. I mean, like I'm condemned. They condemned me for defiling the segregation law. Mm -hmm. Like I've been tried. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And condemned. You know what I mean? And sentenced. How long did you remain? I stayed in jail two 
two hours. And I, when it door slammed shut, being a Baptist, I remember that 23rd song, the 23rd song, the first song, 100th song, 19th song. Mm -hmm. And I recited all the poetry that I knew. Mm -hmm. I even recited some of, and I, uh, uh, what you call it, some of poets, uh, mm -hmm. poetry poems. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I began to recite poetry. And it did to keep me because I couldn't believe that I was in jail. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know what was going to happen. And then all of a sudden, the door, man knocked on the door and say, You have to be fingerprinted. And then I didn't know what was going to happen. Then a man, a little slim one, with fingerprinted me. He said, Well, you, you made it bad for yourself. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. And then, then he said, Then the one who fingerprinted me, he said, Are you from here? Are you from here? I see, I looked at him, I didn't even answer. Mm -hmm. He didn't know. And I, my mother said, you know what saved you, Claudette? No, right, we were, uh, you know what saved you? She said, uh, that little squeaky, high-pitched voice of yours, they didn't realize you was a, a local, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. you said. Well, how did you get out? My mother and my minister, Reverend H.H. Johnson, uh, they come and got me out. And what was it like when you got home? What did your mother say to you about? about oh, this oh, this wasn't um, the first time they heard me talking about um, how we should protest. But this was the first time that you had been arrested. They arrested. But she, um, I had talked to them uh, when I was in, even in the ninth grade at Booker T. Washington when they arrested Jeremiah Reese. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, tell me about that. Jeremiah Reese was arrested when I was in the ninth grade, mm -hmm. and they, he was a minor. Mm -hmm. He was allegedly had raped a white woman. But remind me, when the case come up, um, they, made, they demonized him and said that uh, he had was a serial rapist of six other white women during the summer. And no black a lawyer would dare touch his case. So they had to send out for the NAACP. And, um, so was he defended by the NAACP? Yes, he was defended by the NAACP. And um, some people say that they probably would have given him life if he, wasn't, if he didn't bring the NAACP in. The, his parents, I, his uh, he, his parents were church going. Although he did live in an area called the gravel pit, you know how you get those bad laborers. Mm -hmm. He lived in a it was just one little street, the gravel pit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, poor, 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 a poor community. Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but anyway, um, he was a minor. And they kept him until he became an adult so they could electrocute him. He was electrocuted for uh, going across the boundary. Uh, he defied the, what, how you pronounce it? How you say it? The miscegenation law? Miscegenation law, right. He, 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 yeah, he went across that boundary. Mm -hmm. Now, the white and black women could go across that boundary, but a black and white man could not. Mm -hmm. So... He was electrocuted, so my mother knew how I felt about Jeremiah and other black men and how when a black woman or a girl have the same thing happen to them, nothing is thought about it. You know? So a white man could, could cross that line right. with a black woman, right. but a black man with a white woman, obviously, that was taboo. Right. Yes. They'll string you up yeah. just for the thinking that it was. So you think that, that the this incident with uh with Jeremiah had an impact upon upon you and Yes, him. because we went to the same school that I was going to uh, that I so was you going knew him I knew personally. him personally, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Jack uh, Jeremiah was a drummer in our band. Mm -hmm. And he was a jazzy, good looking guy. Mm -hmm. 
walk, he walk right on his feet. We always say he tried to, oh, we try to say he's trying to keep us stepping in mud. <laughs> but he was, you know, always walk that, you know, not a country yeah. flat footed walk, but light right. on his feet. Mm. And um, he was, you know, very good drama. Mm. Mm. And so. So how did that affect the community? The community was all upset about it, but the black men said nothing they could do because know that you couldn't, you know, they tell a joke. They always tell us a joke, ridiculous joke about a black man looking up under a white woman's dress. You know, that joke, bad joke. Mm -hmm. So they was telling like, you can't even look up what people in a white woman's dress. Or mm -hmm. can't, you know, and you can't stare in her face. I, you know. You can't make eye contact. I, I noticed that when I was working as a young, uh, you know, see white women mm -hmm. when they come around and black men, they just say, yes, my, yes, Miss So-and-so, she here, they there. Mm -hmm. They don't make eye contact. contact. Yeah. You, they don't make eye contact until you got old and you become uncle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then they make uncle. Yeah. Then they make uncle. What was your life like after you had uh, defied the system. Well, I, I lost a lot of friends. I lost a lot of, a lot of my classmates. I lost a lot of friends. Mm. Yeah. Why? Why do you think you lost? Uh, because their parents, you know, didn't want them to be uh, identified with me, who was one of the good girls in the, you know, in the bus thing. They call it the uh, people in my community mm -hmm. say it was the bus thing. You know, mm -hmm. they didn't want it. Why was um, your case not the test case that Rosa Parks? Um, as I say, I, I think I can only know, I, I don't know, but only speculate. Mm -hmm. And these are my opinions. Uh, during that summer, I became very depressed. And um, I was, you know, things happened. And... Um, during that summer, I met. I was introduced to Rosa Parks by. Uh, by the way, I have to tell you this. It was. Uh, it's a long story. C. J. Magnier, who lives here in Birmingham, was married to my great aunt, and she was the first woman to get a degree in a college degree in my family. And he just so happened to be down in Montgomery when I was uh, arrested. My mother got in touch with C.J. Magnier. Magnier? Near, not near, N-E-A-R. Okay. And um, he called, told my mother to contact E.D. Nixon and told her how to do it. And that's how uh, uh, they discovered me my case, you know, mm -hmm. that I had been arrested. Mm -hmm. So E.D. Nixon got interested in this case, and he even got in contact with uh, Rosa Parks. And then my, and when E.D. Nixon told uh, my mother to get in contact with, uh, um, say, uh, Rosa Parks, she said, Rosa Parks, she said, is, are you sure this is the Rosa Parks that used to live in Pine Levels? My mother knew about Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. So I was introduced to Rosa Parks, uh, and then I joined her youth organization. And she asked me to tell my story to her organization. And I worked with her that summer. I used to go to Rosa's home and uh, sleep over. What did you do? You well, I was running for Miss NAACP. It was three other, uh, two other uh, women, girls that was running for Miss Indo. I do not remember their names now. Mm -hmm. um, when I I did have their names, but you know, like living in Moody. Right. But anyway, I know I knew it was two other women that was two other young ladies that was running for Miss NAACP. Right. And Rosa Parks was affiliated with the NAACP. Uh huh. And she was the youth director, and we had. The meeting was held on a Sunday at the Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, she asked me to tell the story. And then later, the, the girl that was there, who was a secretary, she was going to college. And she, Rosa asked me to take her position. And I became the secretary mm -hmm. of that youth group. It was wonderful, but then I got depressed because the people were saying things that was not true about me. Mm -hmm. And I got very depressed. And, you know, what, the were last, they, what were they saying about you? I can't discuss it. Mm -hmm. And um, I was talking. Um, so I met someone, and this someone took advantage of me. And I became pregnant. And the person, and, um, I didn't let my parents, like if you don't, you know, like if you, I was only 110 pounds, so I didn't start to show until I was six months. Mm -hmm. So like in my parents, I would, by them being older, I could not tell them I was pregnant because I knew no way they was going to have, have an abortion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I knew about abortion, but the people that uh, I knew that had had, uh, let me say, that told me about abortion, and then I told them, they told them six months, you know. They, you know, they can look at you and tell. They, right. You know, I can see why they say young girls go overnight, they have those, those people just see that they gain a little weight. And they have, yeah, it can happen. Mm -hmm. Especially if you depend on, your, you know, your first child. Right. You don't show that till you have six months, really. Mm -hmm. So anyway, when I told my mother, I mean, by the way, my family was trying to get me, um, you know, to, you know, just, I don't know, they wanted me just to marry anyone, anyone. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I wasn't going to marry anyone. Mm -hmm. So then I, I ran away. And we, I didn't run away, but I went back to my surrogate mother down in Pine Level, and I stayed. Mm -hmm. Then I came back to Montgomery, and then I had my baby. Mm -hmm. And during that December, so, but I told... You had a baby in Pine Level? No. You came back to Montgomery? No, um... Pine it was my relief place right. yeah. where I go when I'm in want to because it seemed like uh, she understood me more than mm -hmm. my, oh. you know, she understood these things more than my aunt, my great aunt. Mm -hmm. So I would talk to her. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the, how the plan went down. I had my uh, baby in March the 2nd. Not March the 2nd. I mean March the 29th. 1956, but the record is that I, most people think that I was pregnant March the 2nd, but I was not pregnant, pregnant March the 2nd. Mm -hmm. I got pregnant during the summer. Oh, okay. And my baby was born March the 29th, 1956. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that could have been March 2nd. Man. Right, right, right. But anyway, my, I tried to make a comeback, but I felt that I was ostracized because of my baby complexion. He was fair-skinned. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then the people were saying, oh, that's what you want. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I was ostracized. Right. So no one wanted to touch me. Mm -hmm. No one had... This was, you were 16 years old. Yes. No, I didn't, I didn't have any friends. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. And uh, while all of this going on, I was still working... Uh, but I wouldn't dare go back and work in white people's homes. I would work in restaurants, mm -hmm. you know. I would work in restaurants. Right. But most of the time in the restaurants, once somebody find out, oh, you are. Mm -hmm. um, oh, they'd be, but they'd, the workers would be happy that they met the girl that was in it. Oh, this is the girl in the bus thing. Then the employer <laughs> here and say, Oh, this is oh, this is a guy that but then he asked me to do something that I couldn't was impossible for me to do, mm. and then I uh, leave had to leave. Yeah. So, you how long did you stay in Montgomery? Um, I stayed in Montgomery a long time, mm -hmm. and then uh, and how did you work your way out of different jobs? Different mm -hmm. restaurant jobs, you know, I get jobs in different restaurants. Mm -hmm. Remember now, my great aunt was older and she had and she was sick. She was she came down with uh, cancer, and my uh, uh, adopted father, he he had a stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, it was kind of rough. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, but what I what so the the baby lived. Yes, my baby lived. Yes, uh-huh. he lived. My granddad raised him. Okay. And the, uh, then when the people different things began to happen, and I had to go north, right, to get work. Then the community understood what I was all about after half what happened with the children here in Birmingham mm-hmm. and the fire hoses and everything with Bull Carter. Right. I was in Birmingham, you know. I wasn't in Birmingham, I was in New York. Mm-hmm. So I, when I went to New York, when I tried to make a when, con- when did you go to New York? What year? I was up and down. In New York, but okay, like you want to re- get a clear picture, okay. After my son I became um, two years old, I enrolled at Alabama State. Okay. I went there one year, right. but they didn't receive me well because all this, the the teacher, the teachers thought that I was there to bring in an activist movement. But I wasn't. I was just trying to get a degree. And I was there, and I really wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And I did very poorly there. Mm-hmm. And that year I said, Mom, I can't go back. I said, because, uh, but then she said, oh, you never get this t- or once. You never get this chance again. But I need more financial backing. So I wasn't able to pull it. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I did get a, a scholarship from um, the Eastern Stars, right. but um, Mrs. AWS, a- a- she was one of the ones who uh, gave me the scholarship. And that summer, I went to New York, and I was introduced to the young man, and I became pregnant again. Like, life has thrown me a lot of curved balls, right? Mm-hmm. And... Um, then I said, oh, uh, this, uh, this man is not coming up. He's gonna, I'm not going to acknowledge that he's the father. And this is before the DNA, you know. Right. So then I'm up there against it again. So he was a good person, but you know how people are. And he wasn't married. Mm-hmm. And I was in my right mind. I wasn't depressed or anything. I was in my right mind. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say I'm in my right mind. <laughs> I'm like, you're talking like I'm insane or something. Mm-hmm. No, but what I'm saying, I felt better in my life than I had since previously, previously mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. since the uh, uh, altercation, since the bus right. broke, uh, since the uh, arrest. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I felt better. So I said, this, I said, Mom, I'm going to have this baby. I said, okay. even if he, even if he doesn't come to the table, if he doesn't acknowledge that as his son. So anyway, Randy was born um, March the twenty eighth, nineteen sixty. Okay. <laughs> so in New York. No. Came back here. I come. I told you I come okay. back okay. to go on the scholarship that Miss A. W. West right. had given me. Right. And I said, Mrs. West told me to go ahead on and go to school. Mm-hmm. But I said, No, Miss West. They had treated me so badly at the school. I'm not going to do well, and I wasn't doing well at the school. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, that that uh, the uh, scholarship. Wasn't a how you, how do you say this? It wasn't approved at any other college. I only right. could go to Alabama. Alabama State. Right. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, if I could have gotten money to go to any other school, I would have. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, I said I was. I told Miss West. She tried to convince me to go on to school because now I, I was an adult then. Mm-hmm. And by that time, I was an over eighteen. Right. Yeah. So, but anyway, I told her I was doing. Too poorly, and I wasn't, you know. Yeah. So you had the two, two boys. Two boys. Uh, mm-hmm. And you, you, um, you were still living with your, with your aunt. No, after after uh, Randy was uh, born, I uh, when he was two years old. After Randy was born, I run out of jobs, a place to get jobs. <laughs> 
And uh, I would go to, I went to five of all the restaurants in Montgomery. And uh, I left and went on a sleeping job in New York. Mm -hmm. And I decided not to come back down south. Mm -hmm. At that time, I, rem I recall on my first sleeping job, it was when the four uh, girls that was, was bombed, I'm sorry, was murdered yeah. at the 16th Baptist Church. I was in New York then. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what happened. That I recall that day, the little bit I, I attended, to, I was in Nanny, as they call it, New York, mm -hmm. but two little Jewish girls. Mm -hmm. And that was so nice to me, Daddy. And, and I don't know what the parents had told them to go in. Go in. It was on my break. Mm -hmm. And she said, go in and talk to her. And go in, you know. I, when the parents came in, and I wasn't, they were watching cartoons. Um, so I said, what happened? I don't know. I couldn't understand it. I was so, why do these people want me to know what's going on? So they didn't tell me that when it happened, you know, when it, that Sunday, they didn't tell me. They didn't mm -hmm. tell me. I'm like, I'm getting the information because, see, I'm in Morristown, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. okay. So I didn't learn about it. It happened that Sunday, right? Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn about it till that what? The Monday. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I didn't tell you about it. Not right. Like they had to figure a way mm -hmm. how to break the news to me. Right. You know. So how did they break it to you? They all gathered around me. I thought, <laughs> I thought they were trying to introduce me into some Judaism, you know, because <laughs> they were Jews, right? Mm -hmm. So I thought it was, it was all gathered around me. I said, oh, these people are trying to convert me to Judaism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the first thing that come to me. Mm -hmm. The little kids, the, right. the, 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 uh, the, the husband and wife, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, her, her two niece, right, right. two, you know, well, anyway, I said, why did, they don't usually come here on a Monday, they, whenever they do come, it's usually on a, uh, when I'm out, when I'm away on my break, uh, on my mm -hmm. days off, right, that's when the nieces used to visit, mm -hmm. so they can, you know, so anyway, they all gathered around, and that's how I got the news. They all mm -hmm. told me that something mm -hmm. terrible had happened in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. You know. And how did you respond? No, so I, I said, "Oh no, this." You know, mm -hmm. I just, I just went limp. Mm -hmm. I just went limp again. I said, "Oh no, I went limp," and they went and they went and got me some wine. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. So you never did. How, did you ever return to Birmingham? I mean, to to my not to, to live. not to live, only to just for vacation. Just visit. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Vacation, mm -hmm. and you know, while you're sleeping in, and uh, while you're sleeping in, sometimes you get, like if they go on a long break, sometimes they go for two weeks break, mm -hmm. so I take the two weeks off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll come home. Right, right. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. So, and vacation. Right. You know. mm -hmm. So I was, you know, so I've been away yeah. ever since. Yeah. Well, have you... And my son, thank God, well, Ray, uh, my first son, Raymond, he he was kind of like, uh, you know, the one who was kind of needed the more attention. But what I think happened was he got spoiled and he wasn't able to face the world like he's, you know, mm -hmm. manly. And... He got, like all some of the people, he got hooked on the drugs. Mm -hmm. And I lost him in uh, 93 in my apartment. He come to live with me mm -hmm. in 93. And um, Randy, the dark skin one, my complexion, now he, mad he managed to become a um, CPA in, in uh, Atlanta. Is he still in Atlanta? Yes, in Atlanta. And he, was a mentor for my other uh, nephews. Mm, okay. uh, so, so I know you're proud of I'm him. proud of um, Randy. And I was proud of Raymond, too. But then the people said, 
You knew Ray was, you was, and the old people on King Hill would say, oh, Claudette, you knew you wasn't in your right mind. They always tell me I wasn't in my right mind. <laughs> <laughs> you was in your right mind when Raymond was born, mm -hmm. so you know he did well. Mm -hmm. You know he did well. <laughs> you know they always say that, yeah. but that was the problem. Raymond just got out and got with the wrong group, right. and Saskatoon kids do they do that sometimes? You know, mm -hmm. I still, you know I was you know, tell them that yeah. you know, and he uh, Ray, um, Raymond has one son. Uh, has one son. Uh, he, uh, well, anyway, he couldn't deny his son because his son is just like him. Mm. And um, anyway, um, he didn't get married to his uh, the girl, mm -hmm. but she stays in contact in the family. We, uh, you know, we stays in contact yeah. in each so other. Have contact with yes, each yes, each on both sides of the family. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, mm -hmm. Yes, we yeah. just had a family reunion. Randy, Randy got us all together this past July. In Atlanta? In Atlanta. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yes, yeah, so there's been some ups and downs. Yeah. yeah. And my famous quote from one of Langston Hughes' poem Life for me ain't been no crystal stairs. That's right. That's right. Well, I want to thank you for taking time out because you have reiterated this whole story, and we'll be looking forward to hearing you tomorrow in the uh, in the symposium because uh, uh, you you are a shiro. A shiro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And now one other thing, people want to one another thing, people, and the, well, the news media. Well, they tried to. I won't call no names. I just say they want to bring me out. I said no. I said because uh, they had chosen Rosa Parks to be the icon for the movement, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I don't envy her for what she did, mm -hmm. but what I do, not, it's not Rosa Parks. It's the group that mm -hmm. you know, right. the organization sure. that. They should have let the people let the people know that it was uh, that Rosa was the spokeswoman for the best boycott, mm -hmm. and she was rightfully the right person at that time, because pregnant or unpregnant, the adult community wouldn't have rallied uh, behind a teenager, mm -hmm. and. By me being pregnant, that have been a controversy. Right. So you know, and like they chose the right person at the right time. But they should let the people know after those three hundred eighty-one days that it was four women right. that put their their family names because right. at that time the clans was vicious. Right. Or right. uh, on the line. Or is that the way you say on the exactly. line? Exactly. Mm -hmm. That was uh, myself, Mary Louise Smith Ware, Miss Susan McDonald, and the case that the, name, the lady was named Aurelia Browder. Mm -hmm. It was named the case with Browder right. versus Gale. Right. So the people should know that these few women, these four women, mm -hmm. brought, made this bus boycott successful right. and set the stage for other. Civil disobedient uh, right. action. And you're absolutely right. That needs to be known, and that's why we're doing what we're doing here. Yeah. Because we need to get that information out. It's never too late. Because we too much blood has been spilled for this mm -hmm. uh, movement. I don't want to preach that. <laughs> <laughs> too much blood has yeah. been too much sacrifice. Sure. For the young generation not to know it and for it to regress. Exactly. Again, thank you. <laughs> thank and, you. Uh, we'll be looking forward to tomorrow. Thank you. Okay.